Hey guys, what is going on? It is Jay Campbell from the TRT Revolution and the Definitive Testosterone Replacement Therapy Manual, and I am joined by my great friends on our newly coined and named the Decoders of Truth podcast. I've got, of course, Gerald Clark, Rex Bear from the Leak Project, and Matthew LaCroix with his book, The Suppression of Us, and of course, everybody knows Gerald's books. And I just want to make one message tonight for everybody that's watching. Um, we've got a lot of people join our Facebook group now. So when you're watching this on YouTube, if you're not in that group, uh, it's currently called Coders of Truth on Facebook. So we'll put a link to it, but we have a lot of people joining the group. It's the easiest way for you guys to connect with us and leave us your questions and your comments and just, you know, so we can keep the message resonating, so to speak, and vibrating on a week to week basis. So I'm going to jump in, you know, not say hi to everybody. We have some deep, deep, deep questions that we're going to cover tonight, and Jerry's going to tackle the first one. And um, it's really, so how does one remove themselves from the matrix, a.k.a. the simulator, however you want to phrase it, and yet still put food on the table and have funds to purchase reading material? Basically, how do you survive and remove yourself from the simulation, Gerald? Well, first of all, I don't think you can remove yourself from the simulation. You've got to figure out how to operate differently and not violate your integrity. And this is really what it comes down to is um, when you switch over from a mission that's all about seeking money so that you can have a comfortable life, building a big house, putting a fence around it, sheltering yourself in so you feel secure at night and you're with your family, that's, that's one path that most people have been told that's the American dream or whatever dream of from the country you're from, right? You get your little, you get your little uh, palatial setting where you feel comfortable and you can check out behind your secure wall and not deal with the simulator, right? That's, right. that's what we all – so you ask somebody if they could get a bunch of money, what they would do? Oh, I'd go off to some remote place. And pull, <laughs> you know? Well, this is why they want that, right? But the reality is when you switch over to be on a spiritual path, in essence, you've given over complete will to serve yourself, to at least be somewhat open to serving others uh, some percentage of your time. Usually it turns out to a small part that turns into almost all your time <laughs> eventually, right? Service to others is what happens. Well, in that case, when you stop serving yourself, you become somewhat reliant on the community that you're serving to support you, which is an act of faith in and of itself. Right. And a lot of people in religious communities and churches would oftentimes get sponsorship by their community to go proselytize and do their mission or whatever it is the church wanted them to do, right? But they would be supported by the community to do that. So, so, the, yeah, so the question is, how do you get to the place where you're not trying to accumulate wealth to provide security for yourself? Because, listen, security is one of our biggest issues in life. If we don't feel secure then we end up at the low end of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Right. right. You're only worried about the, the basic issues of survival. You're not thinking about the kind of stuff we're talking about on a show like this. Exactly. Okay, so that, those don't go hand in hand, all right? So how, so how do you do this? Well, first of all, number one for me, you cannot live a spiritual life if you're a slave to someone else. So you've right. got to get, get rid of your debt. You cannot have debt. I don't care if that means you cannot have a phone, you cannot have everything everyone else has. Get rid of your debt. Otherwise, you're vulnerable to be manipulated by uh, the system. So that's number one for me, is you got to do that. Okay, if that means paring down your big house to living at much more, living within your means, better yet, live below your means so that you're not, <laughs> not in that situation. So that's number one for me. And that means big life changes. And people don't like that. Uh, for me personally, it meant leaving a million dollar home in Southern California, built in the first days of the development, fully landscaped yard that was worth 50 grand in and of itself. You know how it is, Jay. Yes. To selling everything I had, staying on my, my path, not selling out to go back into a, a situation where I couldn't be this, at the same level of service to others as I had been before. If you go back in and enslave yourself, it's very, very hard to do and serve others. It's almost impossible. Impossible, really. It's very, very hard. So I'm glad you brought this question up. But incrementally, keep your day job and start 
serving others a little bit at a time as you can. Start a podcast, something that doesn't cost any money. Exactly. Right. And start, start doing that. And eventually, um, I think the universe will reach out and initiate you and go, okay, this one is telling the truth. It's serving our purposes for the light. And we're going to find a place to make this one sustainable. And somehow, some way, out of an act of faith, that seems to happen. But it takes, it takes time, especially if you're self-published like you and I, Matt. You've got to be able to be prepared to run a marathon. And yeah. so, but if you, if you can stay in this mission and on your path for at least two or three years so that you can bubble up beyond the noise and people find out about you, You'll garner support. And I've seen people talking about you, Matt, just that way, because I remember I was in the same place you were when right. I started. You know, and it's been, you know, it's been since 2003 when I, or 2013 when I actually really started pushing my research. But the same thing's happening to you that happened to me, right? So, so you, these little steps you take, and you're working a day job, right? You're still going to your day job. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a it's, flexible it's day like job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm yeah. going to let you talk about it because you, you're just starting on this and, and you're about to make some big changes, I think. <laughs> yep. For so, sure, it's already happening. It, it is interesting. It's kind of, it's kind of where um, you have that moment in your life where you decide, how am I going to spend my free time? You know, isn't that, I always like to bring that up, right? It's just, it's just kind of this telling thing that's still left in our society where we have these moments where we have, we have free time where we're allowed mm -hmm. to do whatever we want. It, and you begs the question, why isn't all our time free? So um, when I say free time is the time that you have available to yourself, what are you doing with it? Are you, are you using it to expand yourself? Are you using it to, do, um, to connect to nature? Are you, using it, are you using it to better yourself? Or are you using it to just continue to enslave for money, like, Jer like Jerry was saying? Continuing to be on, the, in the, on this rat wheel, the rat wheel of the matrix of, of money and the control of materialism in our society, the great, the great illusion of us and what controls our perceptions of what is real. And so you must first break away from that, of the idea of what am I doing, spending my time on? Am I focusing on getting material items? Or like Jerry also brought up the idea, we have to first get rid of our debt and all of these things, these material things that we're forced to pay for once we have, mm -hmm. because we mm -hmm. think that those are going to lead to happiness and they only lead to more debt, which, which then leads to having to, having to work more. And so get rid of all the, all the, all the debt you can get to a comfortable, happy place. And then with that free time that you have, that, that the open time that you're not focusing and dedicating to those other distractions, then take it to enhance yourself. It doesn't need, mean everyone has to become, you know, the, the, the carrier of the torch of thought and then d dedicate every single moment of their life to, to truth. But it, but it means maybe they can become a really good person and help other people. You know, right. there are different levels and degrees of what this path has to be. People don't listen. They don't have to be fearful that everything in their life, ha life has to be thrown up in the, in the air and it's all over with. It's more of um, decide for yourself what you want to do with this time while you're here. And right. what is actually going to better yourself? And I can tell you, <laughs> once you do those things that um, that enhance you, you'll feel that you're on that right path because you get an energy boost from it just every time you do something good. That's why people always talk about it. you do something good, you feel good after because there's a very good purpose behind that. <clears throat> um, we're supposed to do good things, not bad things. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt. Rex, Rex, are you there? Oh yeah. Okay. So thoughts. I want to hear your thoughts. Well, you know, one of the things that I've noticed is I've had just about every job you can think of under the sun, literally. By the time I was 21, I probably had 30 different jobs. And awesome. I, literally, and I would just get bored. I would do something for a week and I, I would lose my mind. So I would, I would go on to other things. And it seems like when you finally find your stride and you hit your path, that's it. You'll know it because the universe, like Gerald said, will start putting things right in front of you and you can take advantage of those opportunities and if you can find some way to have a win-win situation with everybody that's the key and get rid of the you know get rid of okay well I, I want to do good for just this group of people or that right. group of people. If you can find a way to help everybody I think is you look at somebody you don't like and you're looking at another part of yourself essentially I mean that's that's what I've come to the conclusion of with all the people that I've worked with in the past when I can't stand a boss because he's just trying to give me that superiority complex and, and prove his might well, really, when you just kind of let that go and be like water and realize if we're all connected at some primordial level and we're looking at somebody else, we don't like them. Well, that's just another part of ourselves, a part of our consciousness. So to let it go 
and, and just realize everybody's on their own path. So that's kind of where I'm at right now and just trying to learn as much as I can. But as much as we can break away from the system, I think the better, you know, if that's what you want to do. I mean, if you want to be a part of the system and live in the suburbs or the big city, hey, good for you. If you want to have a $4 million home in Southern California, that's awesome. And wear a Rolex and drive a Ferrari, hey, fantastic. If you want to be somebody that wants to make change in communities and, and buy up land and, and start building stuff off the grid and waking people up, that's great too. I think you just mm -hmm. need to find what you enjoy and go after that because then it's not I working. I, I agree. Well, said. well, very well. So let me ask you, if you don't mind asking, because I mean, I already know this about Matt and, and, and Gerald, but do you, is the majority, if not all of your income derived from all of your projects with the leak project right now, or do you do other stuff or have other side income streams? Yeah, there's other things that happen with, you know, I do all sorts of things and um, being in public speaking, it's nice because you can, make a lot of friends and acquaintances, meet a lot of people, go to different places around the world. And, and it's, it's really good to make those personal relationships because I've got acquaintances in literally just about every field or line of work you can think of. And they're personal relationships to where they'll listen to me and I'll listen to them. And I think if we can all do that, that's going to be that key ingredient to really making change that's going to have an impact long term. Otherwise, we're just going to be continuing to go inside of this narcissistic matrix, you know, posting everything on social media, <laughs> not really talking to our friends in yeah. real life, just saying, hey, look at me, look what I can do. Right. I completely agree. It's all about collaboration. Very well said. It's I not add, about competing. It's about collaboration. I wanted to also uh, add something to what Rex said. Uh, something that really I was struggling with when I was going through structure work in Hawaii I'll never forget this minute, this moment. I was in the back of a truck and we were riding up to Mount Waialeale. And there was a couple other people in the back of the vehicle. And I was a pretty type A person most of my life, I would have to say. Pretty competitive, too. And, uh, and we were having a conversation, I remember, and, and this person said something. And I remember automatically just saying something. You know how you do to connect with them, to come up, bring up a common topic. So you're talking the same subject with them, right? But when I heard myself say it, I heard myself kind of one-upping the person, right? And so the competitiveness was even showing up in my conversations. And I, I was not aware of it at the time. So at, at finally, um, I got right with myself and I decided, you know what? At some point, you've got to figure out the difference between a preference and a judgment. Yeah, and, it, and so and, and I could do it with widgets and objects and inanimate things. You know, I prefer this over that. But when I found myself doing it with humans, it felt like judgment to me. Right. Until, yeah. I, got, until I got to a place where I saw it from a frequency standpoint. And now I don't see referring to work with this one over that one as a judgment. It's it's a preference to me based on my sense of frequency. And I don't think that's I don't think that's wrong. That's awesome. That's profound. Yeah, you know so. I share that because um, like you, and when you start getting more in the limelight, you're going to get requests from all over <laughs> and every different well, way, way, just direction. And to, to decide what you want to do with your time and who you're going to do it with, that's, that's your choice. Right. But you don't want others that don't get down selected right away to view that, that you're judging them. You see what well, I'm saying? Well, yeah, totally. Because it's, not, it's not a judgment. Well, let me, let me just say real quick, like, you know, my mission parameters right now in life and how, th so this question resonates very deeply with me. I, you know, I haven't shared this with Rex. I've shared this with you guys in a previous call, but like my book is like exploding right now. You know, it's the number one book that's ever been written in, in its sphere right now. I have doctors that want to work with me. I have all of these people that want to, you know, work with me in the quote unquote simulator. And it's, it's kind of harrowing for me because like I have all these different directions to go and all of this quote unquote you know, fame and fortune that can be found behind it. And as I've told Gerald and I've obviously Matt knows, and I'll tell you Rex, like the deeper part of Jay Campbell is like being called to go to Tibet and like work with this thank us. <laughs> like, who's, legitimately, who's legitimately, I'm not kidding you, like sending me messages, you know, she's in a 12 hour time difference or whatever, where she's at. She's not in Tibet. She's in India. Yeah, isn't uh, she? She's in, she's in Dharamsala, India. Dharamsala, right? India. She's and, uh, 10, you know, 10 years into her seeking and, and doing this, mm -hmm. you know, working with masters. And, and she's truly a mesmerizing individual if you see her posts and stuff like that. And it's like, it's very conflicting. But anyway, her and I have had conversations and she said, 
you can't do what you want to do deep down spiritually because you're a father and you have children. And, you know, your children right now, because of their ages, come first and just do what you're doing. Continue on your mission. So, again, this, this statement and this question has very, very deeply resonates within me of what, what I should do. And so I'm glad that we're talking about it because it does at times really it affects me. And, and I, I sometimes go to bed at night thinking, like, what the hell am I doing? You know, I'm selling out because I'm so focused on making money and all these other things that come with what's where I'm going. But I think ultimately, and, and Gerald, you, you've said this to me, and thank you, this has helped me. And her name's Marlene. Yeah. But she says, you just have to manifest the goodness and manifest the service to others. And as yes. long as you manifest that, whatever you do, you will not be in service of self and you will not have money or the pursuit of money as the primary focus of your life. And as long as it's not, you don't have to worry because wherever you're going, you're going to help other people. Yeah, yeah. And, and Jay, mm -hmm. think about it this way. Mm -hmm. um, to be successful during this, you have to be good at the game because it, right. it takes money to, to get through Absolutely. this life. So for, I don't see it as a sellout. I see it as if you were, if you were doing, doing this work with a book to be successful, but in your other spare time, you're working on truth and trying to spread the message. Why is that necessarily a bad thing? Because you're, you're, you're mastering the game on, on both aspects. I don't see that as a bad mm -hmm. thing in any way. Well, it may, it may turn out that you start out that way and you, you keep one foot in your normal life. I did that too for a while. But as you get further and further along and you start getting traction, you're going to see that keeping a foot in that space is really not serving you spiritually, but just feeding your resources may not be needed anymore. And I found, I found actually another thing really interesting is when I had the least amount of money and the least amount of attachment, basically living in a travel trailer in a foreign country <laughs> on the go. I mean, when you in, a, in the middle of a storm, just imagine, okay, how unattached you could feel to everything. Yeah, absolutely. It was at those points when you found deep with it and you learned to really connect with your higher self and get that experience of being guided by your inner truth is when you had the least sense of security in the world. That's why you you I found it the strongest. And I was like, wow, no wonder people want to live like aesthetics and give away all the material things and go, you know, be at the whims of nature because that's where you connect with uh, very deep forces that are guiding you. Uh, right, yeah. You don't have to stay there forever, but recognize that that happens in those circumstances. And, it, and I think it helps you not to be so attached to things that rust and thieves are going to destroy this reality and try to focus on things that clearly have eternal archetypal lessons for your spirit. Right? right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Mm. Right on. Cool, man. Well, that's, I'm, I'm glad we covered this question because I know it's on the top of people's minds and uh, it's obviously, it's very, very heavily resonating. It's um, not, so that, yeah, it's so, not easy. It's, <laughs> no, it's really not. Bed. It's not. And I'm sure it'll come up. It'll come up in other times and stuff like that. But let's, it, it kind of moves. So it kind of moves on to the next question. And, and that's the focus and the pursuit of money. So, you know, again, how does one best do it and still always serve others, you know? And, and before you guys answer, let me just preface this. Like, let's think of this like from an actor standpoint, right? Like we all know actors or we've seen actors who become so, and, I, and, and unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your perspective, I run in some circles. I have some actors who are, you know, B-list, A-list friends. A couple guys are A-list friends or, or I'm associated with. And I see how some of the fame and the fortune, quote unquote, has changed them from a personality standpoint. And you, it just, when you're aware, especially at the levels most of us are, and you see when a person is completely in service to self, you see yeah. how their circles are affected and how their behavior is affected. So I think that's a perfect point for people watching this show to understand what we're talking about. So how does one become successful, make a good amount of money, and still stay in service to others? Yeah. I, I, I want to mention – to that question, the more successful someone is with the system, with money and success, like you mentioned actors and, you know, the idea of being like an idol and worshipped almost, the more successful someone is, the harder it is for them to break out and wake right. up. And so those need to be looked at. You, you got to say at one point, are you playing the game? Did you play the game so much that you forgot what the whole, the, you know, the whole purpose of, the, of it was all along and kind of the distraction became the, the focus. And so we must, we must kind of 
remember that it's a distraction, but we still have to, we still have to perform the distraction because that's the distractions. What uh, is the model of everything in society? You know, the great, the great distraction and illusion of money and us, you know, fighting over these artificial numbers in some, in some system that aren't even a real resource or anything. And so, and, and so we, we have, we can, we can play the game to be successful and to find happiness, but, but not in a way to, to kind of chase materialism a way to, to maybe find a peaceful, happy place where we can then expand ourselves. Right, right Gerald? Yeah, let me give you an example. Um, and I've been all around the world, and I've found that happiness is absolutely uncorrelated with material gain. I agree 100%. And, and one of the best examples for me was uh, while I was uh, living on Kauai studying structural integration, uh, there was a group of people, and you saw people doing pretty extreme things on their spiritual path in Hawaii. Uh, I don't know why. It's like, it's like going on Interstate 8 and landing in San Diego. You're at the end. <laughs> right. There's an ocean. You can't go any farther, and that's where you stop, right? Kind of like that. I got you. Well, the Nepali coastline was that in Kauai. And there was a group of people that had figured out that there's so much natural food growing on the island that if they had a way to make a fire – and had a pot to cook something in, they could survive up off this little valley in, off the Nepali coastline and not own land, not have a job, do nothing but just be. And that, that, uh, the idea of doing that to most people that have a secure living and are going someplace and means something. can't fathom it. It, is, crazy, un crazy. it is unfathomable, okay? But if you do it just for a little bit, you'll find out. It's like living in a travel trailer. I was about yeah. to say, you find out you don't need all of that. It's so stuff. freedom and taunting. Yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah, that. yeah. So you take yourself wherever you go, and you learn to be whoever you are wherever you go, and you're not who you are because of what you got or what you're doing. You know, and when you finally get to that place, it changes a lot of things for you. It's part yeah, of the. Do you need this? Path. It's part of your. Right. Spirit. No. So, so what, it's funny that you mentioned that because the most cathartic slash liberating experience of my life was when I realized, not realized, I mean, I was going through the divorce, but I was downsizing from a 4,400 square foot home in Las Vegas in Red Rock Country Club in a very ritzy part of Red Rock Country Club, Las Vegas. And my kids have been kidnapped from me and I've been, you know, in jail and charged with like multiple you know, completely fabricated uh, charges, but hey, I, you're telling my story. This is not allowed, right? You could, you could come. You, yours can come right after this. But mm -hmm. I remember, and and, you, and Gerald, this is going to resonate so deeply with you. Um, I remember being in my garage of this house, and I had just had the day before. I'd been on, you know, Craigslist. All the Craigslist bargain hunters had come through my house and just eviscerated everything for nothing, dollars on, you know, peanuts. Mm -hmm. And there was not much left. But I was going through. Um, Christmas and Halloween decorations and whatever. And, you know, and there were sentimental value, right? Because it was Chotskis and stuff from my kids and stuff like that. And I was just like, my God, I, I'm losing everything. And one of my really, really good friends who's, I won't mention his name, but he's very, very well to do, very, very successful, lives in a $3 million house in Valencia, California. I, he, he, for, just out of the blue, he just randomly texted me and I said, hey, can we talk for a second? Can I call you? You know, because I was melting down. And when I told him what I was thinking, he was like, Jay, I, and I mean this in all sincerity, I will switch with you right now. Do you have any idea how lucky you are right now to be getting rid of all of that meaningless stuff? All of this stuff, right? This stuff that's house that you keep, like, you know, Jerry, like you said, these things that you hold on to that people feel they put meaning and substance to that are literally stuff. It's like you're hoarding things that have no intrinsic value other than what you label them. And so he completely, sh you know, paradigm shifted me and made me start thinking that this was a great start for me because now I'm going to be like you were saying, Gerald, in a small one bedroom apartment downsized with nothing other than my things and my clothing. And it's a fresh, clean start. But it took that you know, for a guy living mm -hmm. in, you know, in a seven or 8,000 square foot house with all these things saying, dude, I will switch places with you. Yeah, to well, make sometimes it, that's what it takes is to have it all pulled out. Yes. And then you realize how enslaved you are to it. Exactly. And that's what yeah. he said. He goes, Jay, this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to you. Embrace this opportunity. Well, that's, that is one of the downfalls of success, actually. Uh, speaking of that, uh, you know, there's a tradition in India where Marlene lives and that, uh, by the time men reach the age of 40, 
they're in certain traditions, they don't all do it, but they would give away everything that they have. And they knew that that was the period that they went on their spiritual path for. Yeah. Until, until you had, they had to force getting rid of all the materialism to truly connect with us. Now, How great. awesome. So think about it. I was really 40 years old when that happened. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding you. I really was. Symbolically, this was in 2011. Well, look how far you look how far you've come in five years. You're right. So, I mean, but think about that. That really was that part, whatever that's called, and you know, in Indian terms, you know, it's like giving up your dowry or whatever, giving up all the possessions. It's like that. Wow, that's that's deep. That's resonating with me right now. But that's that's probably what happened. Well, that's, what, probably, what you, that's probably why you want to go over to, to uh, live the life of the masters of the Far East. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> well, Rex, Rex, you're still there. What do you, What are your thoughts, Rex? I'll tell you, it's fascinating stuff. When you were bringing up earlier about how you really want to go over to, you said Tibet, right? Or was it right. India? I mean, India, Tibet, you know, work with, like Gerald said, ascended masters, train under them. Well, I actually, it's funny you say that because I just got done working with somebody that actually went out to Tibet and he was there for about four months and he just went on this vision quest. He's into yoga and stuff like awesome. that. He said, man, to the women out here are just beautiful, Rex. You got to come out here. I said, well, you know, I, I can't. But you know, he, he said, hey, man, it's just, it was just, it blew his mind. And he came back from there. And I could tell he was a changed man, but he wants to go there again. And as far as the material stuff, it's not really a big deal to him. And, you know, myself personally, do you own stuff or does stuff own you? It's, it's great to have nice things, but do you want to have a whole bunch of stuff to where you can't keep track of it? I would much rather be out on the you know, at some nice peak in the mountains where it's 13,000 feet up or, or doing something out in the open instead of worrying about a giant mortgage, <laughs> take care of, you know, all these bills and issues because bills and issues, everybody has bills and issues, but uh -huh. it seems like people that, you know, okay, I got to get a bigger house, a bigger car. I got a bigger TV and, and look, my neighbors, they just got a new yard. So my yard's got to be better than theirs and they can't even <laughs> keep up and they're paying these bills that they, they really, even though they're making great money, it's tough for them to save enough to where if they lost their job three months down the road, they'd be toast financially. There's no doubt. I got a little golden nugget for you. Uh, Krista and I sat down one day and we tried to assess what are the key things that we need for us to be happy. And it was just, just a short list, just a short list. It was like, okay, we need a, a room, the great view. You know, something inspiring when you look out. It, Absolutely. You know, because you, you spend a lot of time indoors as a human. So when you look out, you want to see something inspiring. Um, you want to have a great mission. And you, and you simply want to have enough resources to do that mission. You give me those, and I'm going to be happy. So, Ger so Gerald, that's, you just, those are mesmerizing. So define, yeah. define a great mission, you know, for, not for us, but for the audience. What defines a great mission? Well, when you do something to serve others, generally you become like a free agent <clears throat> and the universe will use you whenever it needs you. And, that, and when you find that out, it's like, oh God, you can tell you're being used right now because you're burning it at both ends. You don't know where this inspiration's coming, but you're putting it out there. And then all of a sudden you get a break and you get it put out to the pasture with Job for a little while, right? <laughs> and, and when you end up on this path, that's what generally seems to happen. So, if you were to say something to the effect of who I am is the possibility of possibilities, in other words, you're saying, forget my will, what I want, use me to service of others. And Don't you become a you do that, When you do that, you get everything you need, okay? <laughs> when you yeah. are someone else, it's, it comes back to you. So, so I, can't, I, I mean, I can't agree more. I mean, you're, you're so right. I mean, I mean, you're a perfect example of that right now. You're being called by multiple different creatures and entities and people from all around everywhere. And it's like when you're pulled in so many different directions, sometimes you can get confused or mm -hmm. confused as to what direction you go. But right now I know you're just choosing to go, like you say, glide path and where, wherever, wherever it feels natural. Well, but now, you're, now you just said the exact key word is how do you know that you're doing your mission? Well, guess what? You're going to wake up in the morning. It's going to feel right. It's going to get you out of bed. If you're, right. if you're doing something that's not, that you can't even get out of bed in the morning, you've got to change. You're on Absolutely, the wrong thing. Yeah. You're on the wrong thing. And how many people, though, how many people, seriously, let's be honest, we'll go back to that whole 90, 95% club. How many people truly wake up every morning inspired, excited about what their day encompasses? 5%, 10% yeah. tops? 
Twenty percent at the most. Oh, five, maybe five percent. Right. Most well, people are working absolutely don't want to work. They're they're working trying to figure out how to get out of it so they can have free time and do what they want. I'm okay. actually kind of amazed how positive people actually are doing the the jobs that they do every day. It's 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 to me it's you know that grind of that. Rat There's a lot race. of lithium in the drinking water. Yeah. <laughs> Right. And there's a reason why it's called a rat race because it's like being in a rat cage just running around. And in, in, in my book, The Illusion of Us, I mentioned how money materialism is kind of like it's, this, it's like the farmer leading all the sheep, you know, humanity, the, the collective of humanity along with this carrot. And carrot, the carrot represents materialism and money. And n they never actually get that carrot if they just right. leap around throughout the farm, right? And it's just it, because it's, it's unobtainable. They're never going to get it because it's not real. It's, it's just, it's the illusion of distracting them from the focus of their time. What are they going to spend their time that they have, this vital time in this, in this current mortality? What are they going to do with it? What are they so, going to focus it on, right? So it comes down to what Gerald and what, you know, all of us have discussed previously about, you know, it's our DNA. I mean, we've literally been tweaked and tuned to, to pursue, you know, these false constructs, um, you know, for, whether it's because we're just miners or the primitive worker and, you know, we've just evolved a little bit due to technology and obviously our, our time on earth or our, you know, our evolution as a species, but it's all, it truly is all fascinating that some of us, you know, as we say, you know, can somewhat rise up out of the simulator to embrace, you know, whether it's entrepreneurialism, you know, breaking off the grid, connecting with nature, doing whatever it is that we do. I mean, obviously we're all like-minded people. That's why we're here, but you're right. So there's so few of us. Uh, I was, uh, I was thinking about that. And you know, uh, you're, this gal, uh, Marlene, said something that struck me on my YouTube channel. And I think you made a comment, Jay, something about there's just not enough of us. And she said, well, guess what? It only takes the square root of 1% of the population to reach the 100 monkey theorem. Absolutely. That's right. And you know what I found myself doing? I had to go calculate 1% of 7 billion people and took the square root of it. And do you know what that number came out to be? What was it? It was only like just over 8,000. I was like, really? And wow. there's millions of us. You, we know, you know yeah, that. So, so the idea that it only, I don't know where she came up with that number to be the 100 monkey there, but I thought it was interesting. <laughs> but I had to sit down and calculate it and go, well, well what does that well, come out to? So. Well, I think let's, let's see right now then for a second because it goes into what we were talking about off the air about, so you just said, Matt, let's, let's stay there and then we'll, we'll tackle these other questions in a minute. But you're right. There are millions of us, and there's becoming even more millions of us by the day. Shit, Absolutely. by the hour. Mm -hmm. And yeah, all, of us, all of us can use the Facebook story, and Rex can talk about all the different people he interviews and all the kooks and the aware people and the seekers that are on his channel because he has a massive audience. But it's truly amazing when you start talking to some of these people. And as I told these guys, and I'll share my story real quick, but I – a lot of people, because, you know, this is, we're, we're, we're gaining notoriety from the group, from YouTube, whatever. A lot of people are coming out of my past now and reaching out to me and saying, oh, wow, Jay, I had no idea that you were into this stuff, quote unquote, seeking alternative consciousness, you know, esoteric, all these things. And they're telling me stories and all of them have the same root, root issue of, I just woke up one day and I was drawn to this. So, so let me ask you, Matt, st to go first, and obviously I know you wrote a little bit about this in your, in your book, The Illusion of Us, but isn't it not true that people literally are waking up right now due to some sort of cosmic, you know, whether it's radiation, solar waves, whatever, but some sort of radiation that's emanating now from the universe, whether it's the orbital passage of Nibiru, whatever, people are just all of a sudden waking up, being tuned differently than they've been tuned all the rest of their, their previous lives. You know, when, when I was doing this research and looking into all these things, one of the most fascinating aspects of this was the Mayan culture, you know, and of course inspired by Th Thoth the Atlantean. Um, but the, the idea that they have pyramids that are built to basically show the levels of where consciousness would be at a certain right. point in time. So they could, they could look out through the cosmos and say, we're going to look at the vibrational wobbles of the planets right. and where the zodiacal houses are lining up. <clears throat> And where this, maybe the sun, sunspots and the energy is coming in, and we can actually time and, pr and predict when c consciousness within the collective will reach a certain point. And wow. that blew my mind, you know, thinking about that. So then, you, <clears throat> then you, you think to yourself, well, then you can actually predict consciousness. And then 
you look at work like Gerald's done where we look into um, Nishida having this latent DNA aspect of where maybe when, when we, we reach the right point where it's a more peaceful society where there's more free will, more free will but not full free will, then all of a sudden that latent DNA will activate and then we'll, we'll wake up, right? And so the right time is very important because uh-huh. if it's not the right time, it's a bunch of stakes of people burning on it. Like in the right. old- so, well, so- well, that's, I'm going to follow up with what you said, Matt, because you're exactly right. I started following uh, Joseph Kalaman's work uh, when he was decoding the Mayan calendar. And this led up to uh, the understanding of the Zulkan calendar, which had right. nine rows and 13 columns, seven, seven days and six nights of creation, right? So you're 13 there in the columns. And it was very interesting to me that that was a countdown calendar that was issued starting from the Mayan's long count date of August the 11th, I believe it was, in 3013 BC. Well, if you knew that, you know, that nine frequencies were getting dispensed that caused levels of consciousness to unfold, probably specified by the lords of the nine cycles, right? So whichever one's in in charge of this cycle is in charge of how consciousness lines up to be available, to be merged into the plane with another dimension of consciousness. And we're talking about the holographic reality according to thought. And I do have this diagram that I can talk to. So I correlate the nine Mayan underworld frequencies in a blog on my website right, with the Zulkan calendar and these potential latent circuits that could come on in humans. I think those come on in a lifetime, though when you're at the stage. Whereas when we get to the level of consciousness we are now, we're supposed to be at universal consciousness, right? In the, in the Mayan calendar. That happened. And this was, and this was uh, Ian Lundgold's work. And he actually came up with a Gregorian mapping from the Mayan calendar to our current calendar. So you could go back and forth. Right. And and he believed that uh, we were going through the galactic center and that the, the Mayan calendar actually stated that we would be going in October of 2011, not December 21st, 2012. But either way, if we do enter this place, the, the question comes up, A, how wide is the galactic center? How long does right. it take us to go through there? And at what point do we reach the apex of the energy that seems to be lighting up our antennas and waking people up? This There's is- no question it's happening right now. Right. I have that, was in my, that was in my first book, and I believe it had everything to do with the dif- differential and energy at the galactic center. Or, or, you know, this place where the solar system's migrating through this equatorial band of the, of the galactic center. G- Gerald, as smart as you are, I believe that your books came out in the timing that they came out. You know, this, none of this is a coincidence. No, it's not. I, I was as surprised by it as many other people were. But I was talking about stuff like this. I was an electronic circuits and systems designer, okay? Right. Building circuit boards and writing programs inside field programmable gate arrays, okay? <laughs> what in the world am I doing? <laughs> you were the right man for the right? It was in my path, and I was supposed to do it, and I yeah. can't explain it, so. Everything and so many free. people, though, so many people are reading your books books now and they resonate so deeply and it's like i told everybody and you know the people who have watched from the beginning of the show when you know rex wasn't on the first couple episodes but i mean when i was reading gerald's second book and of course i read gerald's first book when it came out in the first two months you know i'm a very big student of the anunnaki but it resonated so deep inside of me and my chakras and my energy field and everything about me that i was telling everyone in my inner circle guys this is the book I remember literally talking to Matt and say, Matt, you've got to read Gerald's second book. And I don't even think, Matt, you had even read Gerald's first book at that time when I first talked to you. And it was no. just – No, you know, just, but, but I, I have it, though. I wouldn't I – wouldn't. No, 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 no. I'm saying it was so <laughs> electrifying. It was so electrifying to people who are consciously aware and are seekers to read and absorb. It was just like, like you know, you talk about the electrical capacitance, Gerald. Mm-hmm. And it was like every, you know, capacitor in my body was just supercharged. And I was just firing at the most the highest resonant luminosity. And well, when, like, you, when you experience that, that's how you know the information A is for you. Right. And B, watch out because when, when you wake up to that level, generally, you get given a new mission. Yes. A yep. mission that's designed to serve. There it is. And there's no going back either. And that's that's a, my that, mission, that mission comes from... None other 
than the initiator himself. And you oh, guys know who I'm talking about. Mr. Thoth. Mr. Thoth. That's his job. There's the no question. Torch. You get passed on. You, you get handed the torch. You, that's you right. It well, it turns out he's got a lot. I mean, million, he's got millions of uh, people that uh, are his agents, if you will. Well, right. that's why it's called lights. They're just yeah. light. He yeah. just gives them. Exactly. That's what that's all the torch is. It's just giving out light. Exactly. So, Rox, how crazy do you think we all are? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all crazy in our own right, which is a good thing, obviously. You know, if we were too sane, then it would get boring. But, you know, you're talking about the age of enlightenment and stuff like that. I really think what it boils down to, if you want to look at the bigger picture, is the age of Aquarius. Yes. Is what it really comes down to. And you, know, you look to the stars, and as above, so below. There's a connection from the largest to the smallest. Yes. And yes. when you look at the age of Aquarius, what is that? Well, that's when people wake up. And that's what's happening right now. We're Absolutely. starting to realize how much nonsense and lies and deceit we've been force-fed our whole lives. And I'm actually going to be talking to somebody later tonight after this presentation doing another show because I saw an article recently that said um, in the state of, where is it at? Or no, it's a city in Pennsylvania. It's a county in Pennsylvania where they were going to require children to be vaccinated with the uh, what is it? Not the Gardasil vaccine, essentially. Right. And so I said to myself, okay, this is funny because they tried this before. They made it mandatory in Texas. They, you know, uh, the governor passed an executive order making it mandatory. And now they've got dozens of multi-million dollar lawsuits out because of all the side effects and just horrific things that happen to people <laughs> who rejected with this. Right. And I said, okay, so I'm going to do some research and find out if this is really true. And they are trying to pass this law in Pennsylvania, but they, they weren't able to. So now they're just pushing this PR campaign. And so I started doing some research. I looked at the actual inserts of these vaccines. Right. And the inserts, I mean, you can go directly to the manufacturers of these vaccines and read the inserts. And you're talking aluminum, formaldehyde. Wow. Uh, then Very they did a placebo. They did a, they did a test against placebo. So they tried to make, they tried to skew the numbers because if you think of a placebo, you typically think of something just like salt water or something that's going to have no effect. Well, what they put in the placebo was an aluminum adjuvant that's got a patent by Merck. So it's not a placebo. Oh, the exact same aluminum adjuvant. So there wouldn't be a placebo ever involved. Let's put it in the, the same effect as the other one. Yeah. Wow. So and I thought to myself, okay, so this blows my mind that this is mandatory. There's actually three states in America right now that it's mandatory to take the Gardasil vaccine. It's Rhode Island, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. Washington, let's, go, let's take this a step further. Hold on, hold on. Let's take this a step further. I started doing research on every single vaccine that you're mandated to take in order to go to public school in most places. And every single vaccine that I looked at, except for a couple that were orally injected or, you know, orally taken. Administered, yep. Administered, thank you. My mind's going a million miles right now here. It's good, so man. Keep it they, going. Okay, so essentially, aluminum, formaldehyde, sorbitol. Wow. They've got latex on the tips of these needles. So when you inject it into the bloodstream, sometimes the latex will get into the blood. Absolutely. And you can read the side effects right open as day. Seizures. Passing out. There's okay. Make sure if you take this vaccine that you watch this person for 15 minutes because they might they pass might out. Die. <laughs> the the person that actually made or or helped make that Gardasil vaccine came out on CBS and said, "I wouldn't recommend this. You you really need to know what you're giving your children." <clears throat> and so to make a long story short, almost every single vaccine that you give your baby or that you take has some type of adjuvant. Not necessarily thimerosal, but aluminum or it's something horrible, else man. in there that's going to cause an immune response. It's horrible. You know, well, let's add the, uh, the genetically modified blood. They have genetically modified DNA that they're adding in some of the uh, hepatitis vaccines now. So welcome, everybody, to the New World Order. So, Sorry, so Rox, hold on. Let me ask you a really tough Sorry. question then. <laughs> this is, no, no, this is fascinating. We're all big students and anti-vax, and you know, there's a guy in, in the group, in the Facebook group, I think you guys saw his post today, talking about he's panic-stricken, he's got his third kid on the way, and he's in Virginia, and he knows about I, this. I saw that. So, so, what, so, Rex, so what is the big picture? And let me just go down, let me, let me put my reptilian shapeshifter hat on real quick, and let me ask you, I mean, if we're hybridized, if you know Dr. Dave Jacobs is right, and they've been tweaking us, and they're doing all these things, so are is this the new stringent 
you know, policy of tweaking the vaccinations and forcing them and mandating them to the people, what is the bigger picture goal? What is the ulterior motive of giving, you know, humans or, or hybrids or whatever we are now, these high risk drugs or, or, or medications. I mean, what, what is the long-term gain or, or end game goal for this? Everything I'm about to say, folks, is just a conspiracy. So don't listen to anything. No okay. Problem. Eugenics. Um, let's cause designer diseases. Let's go after somebody's nervous system. Let's put something in somebody's body where 10 years down the road, they're going to have a certain reaction where they're going to need new treatments to take care of what's going on in their body right now. Uh, let's, yep. let's, let's think of all the possibilities here. Now, you can look into, I mean, just read the inserts. That's all. Right. Like formaldehyde. Right, 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 right. right, right. <clears throat> Thimerosal, that's the best part. That's the stuff that's probably, I mean, the genetically modified <laughs> stuff they're putting in there. And then this most the of the are made in China. So who knows what they're really putting in them, but they're good for you, folks. So, this, so, your, so your take then, and Gerald, you're following this. Your mm -hmm. take is this is just more eugenicism or eugenics, eugenic, eugen, uh, eugenetic movement by the elites. To and it's changing the DNA, like you said yeah. earlier. Okay, right. Okay, so that's where I was going. Yeah. So if yeah. it's tweaking our DNA, what is beyond the, you know, again, we're putting our reptilian shape-shifting hat on. Uh, I mean, is that really, isn't there some, something of that? What, what is your, what's your answer to that, Gerald? Well, I think it's pretty clear that there's a culling going on and that if you're not a willing go along, be enslaved readily down with the new world order system, that uh, you're the enemy. So they're basically trying to, I don't know, vaccinate, dust, uh, genetically modify your food, slash, whatever they can do to you to take away the gift that your creator gave you so that you can wake up and be a hero, they absolutely don't want that. They want you to be a dumbed down slave that's going to do exactly what you're told. And if you do anything other than that, you're unwanted. And uh, they're, they're going to look to get rid of you. A detuned meat modem. How about Let that? Let me throw in uh, something real quick. Uh, I've got a friend that is a principal. And she said, because I brought up the vaccines one time, and I said, well, what about the mass studies that have proven that many people, their, their IQs actually have been lowered by at least 10 points after vaccines? For sure. And, mm -hmm. and she said, uh, she's a principal, and she goes, well, at least we don't have to worry about smallpox. Wow. Yeah, I'll tell you. It's almost, it's almost like they know about it, but it's just like whatever because it's there's yeah. no disease at least, right? Yeah. Yeah. Even though that's the total opposite's really true. It's crazy. So I think I think the long term uh, plan is they want to get rid of your aspirations to know about your creator. So the idea right. of this fun facts and getting rid of a genetic material that connects you back to the source. I think that's part of the gift that Anki gave us. That that's really it's, it's probably being targeted yeah. to be removed, and I think so, exactly. Rex just so, did a so show it's on really just part. Of, it's it's really a bigger part and parcel mm -hmm. of the transhumanism AI game to just meld us into a non uh, a subspecies of what we really were or, or, or created. You know, before the Anunnaki tweaked us and and, and, and dabbled in us and whatever, and then obviously the, all the other species, which lends us right into the next question. Um, but I'm glad you brought that up, Rex, because I've also, too, been looking at that, and I, you know, as a father of an eight- and a six-year-old in California, and knowing that mm. California has now mandated that you're not going to high school if you're not vaccinated with all these different things, I mean, you know, that's something I have to look towards. I've got to wait till seventh grade now, so I've got a couple of years to figure things out, assuming we're all here still by then, but... Let me throw something out here real quick for you, sure. Jay, because sure. you have kids, and I'm not telling anybody to or not to get a vaccine. You do what you want to do. Um, if you read the inserts and if you actually read them, there's no way you exactly. folks, there's a lot of words there that you might not understand. I had to actually Google about a quarter of the, the big words to find out what the actual term was. Right. And I'm telling you, they're telling you right there, seizures, neurological There's disorder, no way if you read a source that they do it. And then no. they'll say, okay, there's only 1% chance this person will get this. There's a 1% this, 1% that, 3% that, 4% over there, 5% over here. By the time you add it all up, it's practically everybody. I was about to say 15% die. Oh. It's incredible, oh. man. It's, it's absolutely, I mean, again, they're, it's like Gerald just said. They're preying on the go along, get along mentality, the intimidation tactics, the high schools and the grade schools, all the people that work there are trained to tell the parents who abstain, oh, 
You can't do that. You, 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 your kids can't come into school. It's illegal. They tell them to say that. But it's now they've actually ruled in California, and again, I'm sure it's going to be all 50 states before long, that you can't get out. There's no abstention. There's no you know, abstaining <clears throat> for religious causes or beliefs. I mean, they're basically just forcing us now to be, as Gerald says, detuned meat modems with no heroic mission. But I think something's going to happen, and I think something's going to happen relatively soon in our it future. Has to. And I think along, we talk about how politics is going to evolve and how money is going to evolve, religion is going to evolve. Another large part of our society that's going to evolve is all aspects of medicine. And I think what's going to happen is the pharmaceutical industry with the money and the, the, aspect, the idea that it's based purely on, on financial gain and not health, and then how it's right. all artificial compounds that are detrimental, and then, and then looking at things like vaccinations and looking at all these things, that entire aspect of medicine is going to collapse, and it's going to totally have to change. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do when you're talking about everyone has kids and worrying about these mandatory situations, if, if everybody doesn't stand up and, and, and demand change, nothing's going to happen. And so that's what we really do. Listen to this real quick. I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but listen to this real quick. I went to the website to see exactly what the vaccines that you need to get now, you know, in order to go to public school, what they require you here. And, um, okay, here, where are we at here? This is a big deal. This is a big deal bait. This is a big deal for Matt and Rex because you guys both have kids that are in school. And listen, when this is all said and done, I want you guys to talk. To, we're going to talk about this and right. you, we need to say, okay, let's go to that scenario. Now, what are you going to do? Right. No, we are talking about leave people hanging like this. No, go ahead, Rex. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, to listen to this real quick. This is just one shot. They want your babies to have multiple doses of this stuff. I know. Okay, here we go. Um, ingredients. 0.5 milliliter dose includes 1.5 milligrams of aluminum phosphate. Wow. 100 micrograms of formaldehyde. That's just one shot directly into your bloodstream. There's right. nothing. To and this is a newborn infant. Right I mean, into your blood. Developing this is a newborn as a baby. infant, by the way, who doesn't yeah. even have a built immunity system yet. It's That's one shot. One shot. Yep. Mm -hmm. One shot. I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you, after I read the ingredients that they put in these things, I don't know how more babies don't die. I don't know how we're here, to be honest with you, because this is we've been well designed. Statistically, it's unbelievable. Statistically, seven to ten percent, and that's the math from thirty years ago when they didn't have all of these new, you know, crazy, um, you know, mixes and and as you said, different compounds and, and particulates and constituents. There's it's so much more dicey now. I mean, again, all we have to look at, guys, is the autism rise, the rise of yeah. autistic children. It is un and neurological disease too. It's parabolically, statistically imp an impossibility unless this was not all engineered, as Gerald has said multiple times on this show. Mm -hmm. All of this has been engineered. Rex is right. They are preying off of uneducated people, which again, you know, sheep will do as sheep will do. Unaware. Well, what about the people that know about it, Jay? But they're in fear. They do well, it anyway. I know. I know. Well, they're yeah. in fear, and that's what I mean. The schools use the intimidation and the fear tactics to tell them, "Well, you don't have an option." You can't, your kids can't go. Well, to let's go down this path for a minute. Yep. What are your options? You know, you don't want your kids in an institution. They're telling you can't go unless you let them stick them with this crap. Well, obviously there's only one answer. You cannot put your kids no. in that kind of situations. So you go, okay, well, I'm going to homeschool my kids and get them out. And I'm going to suffer financially because one of us is going to have to stay home. Can't right. Go, right. This is the, the, what happens. Yep. Well, guess what? It's more important for you to cut back on the lifestyle that you're living and get those kids to a safe place where somebody's not telling them they got to be stuck. You exactly. gotta, you got, you're going to have to make radical changes in your life. You cannot go forward the well, way you cannot. You, you cannot. You cannot. Find My a community, community of people. Vaccinated. Find a community of people that you can culminate a teacher within them. Figure out a way to do this as a community. The NEA in America has to go. And the government has no business being in the education and the mind controlling of children. Okay? If you were to put kids into a cir circumstance and just simply fan the flame of what that child is capable of, irrespective of your agenda, you would be amazed at what would come out. 
Yeah. Because they'd all yeah. be doing their own missions and we'd all be getting what we're supposed to get. I, I wish the guys that wrote the book, you know, that, you know, Krista put into the, the third, the war on masculinity and biological systems, you know, the, the, the sanctity of human blood. I wish those folks would come out and do a part two and update their book based on today's vaccinations because it's true. I mean, it's exactly as Rex said. If people actually knew what was in this stuff, there would be riots. Oh, Nobody... Absolutely. Nobody would even send their kids to public schools. The public school infrastructure would collapse overnight. Well, let me ask you an obvious question of what I see as really disturbing to me. I'm watching people peacefully protesting in the streets all over the world and police officers walking up with a chemical weapon and spraying <laughs> it in their face and nothing happens. Listen, I'm telling you, if somebody sprayed chemicals in my face and and – I would not be calm. I'm telling I'm you. Filthy effects of tear gas. Is, I have tear. Mean, we, we consider that normal. Like the, that the is not normal. normal. Listen, if somebody does that to you, this is an act of war. Right. An act of war. So why are people taking it like roaches? Okay, tears? well, Gerald, to get back to what we've been saying, I mean, again, 95% of people have no energy balance. They have no alignment. Their chakras are blocked. They can't feel anything. They're so dumbed down. Anything that an authority figure, as Matt says, a savior, a leader, tells them is the gospel. We can't re react. I'll tell you guys this perfect example. Yesterday or Tuesday when I was leaving at the airport in Cabo San Lucas, there's this silly giant like you have to, to, to walk into the Baja Cantina in the middle of the airport, which all the people I was with, the four people who were leaving, were eating. You have to walk all the way around and there's this little tiny stair and I climbed over it. Otherwise, it would have taken me five minutes to walk around. And this guy, this Mexican who works there attacked me and said, what are you doing, sir? I'm like, I'm going to my table. I've already sat down. I've ordered food. I'm paying at your establishment. You can't go through here. You're not allowed to do this. You've got to follow the rules. And I looked at this guy, and I was like, you're a maniac. Who cares? Go back to your $5 an hour busboy job. Who cares about the rules? I'm just going to sit down at my table. But that's the point is, is that we're living in a society where everyone mm. has been conditioned that the rules – is what must be obeyed. Mm -hmm. It's not about critical thinking or what's the right thing to do or what's the logical, the most sensible thing to do. It's you have to follow the rules. And the yeah, rules well, I have to, hey, I got to throw something out here real quick. Go ahead, go ahead, All right, you got me wound up here. Now, yeah, I see yeah. people beat the <laughs> piss out of each other over sporting events all the time. I watch people get in fights because of the, mm -hmm. the certain college that they went to or their political <laughs> beliefs. Isn't that amazing? Yet, you, children are being poisoned at a mass Whoa. scale, and, and that's okay. Now, check this out right here. This is one vaccine. This is the DTaP vaccine, okay? For the adjuvant, they use 33 milligrams of aluminum. I'm sorry, 0.33 milligrams of aluminum, polysorbate 80. Toxic. Wow. Then they throw in 42 and a half milligrams of sucrose, <laughs> then five micrograms of formaldehyde, and then 50 micrograms of residual bladderhaldehyde. That's another form of, uh, it's like a lower formaldehyde oh and here you go here's residual bavine serum albinum albumin and yeah there you go that's basically so Jared, there's stuff, your sucrose. you guys there's your oh, yeah. sucrose to destroy your chemo receptor so that your insulin doesn't work which you know we've already talked about yeah, yeah. well we had a good discussion about uh that <laughs> as a matter of fact yeah, every you know, chemical that they can give us to overwhelm our systems and yeah. make us function or i'm sorry make us dysfunctional they give it to us exactly yeah. hey i wanted to give a plug out to uh the guys who did the book on the forks over knives a couple of doctors wrote this book that Chris yep. is reading right now. It's an amazing book. And she's had some people asking her about, you know, I'm on this medication. I got to take this insulin. I'm a type 2 diabetic. Well, guess what, people? His, this research from this book, and I'd forgotten this, points to the fact if you adopt a plant-based diet, Yep. You can reverse type 2 diabetes. You don't need insulin. We talked about it today. I did a podcast earlier today about the same thing on, our, you know, on the Ask Jim yeah. and Jim show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These doctors are telling people to eat sugary, sugary fruit and citrus fruits and take diabetes medication so they can stay hooked on their freaking insulin. It's a joke. It is a joke. 
They're just doctors. drug dealers, right? They're just drug, drug dealing doctors. Yeah. Drug dealers. Yeah. It's like they're ignorant of like biochemistry and basic human metabolism. I mean, it's incredible. It's like, dude, you cannot give someone who is insulin insensitive, already on metformin, already dependent on injecting insulin two or three times a day, sugar. What, I mean, hey, are you retarded? In, in five days of a diet change with this woman who's yes. communicating with Krista. She came off <laughs> insulin. Well, she's already down to half half of her insulin dose and, and bleeds. Should we offer it a month? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, it's unbelievable, dude. I mean, that we could go. That's a whole other subject. We'll mm -hmm. talk another time. But I'm glad you brought it up. But again, doctors don't give a shit. Uh, forget it. If you need to be, you need to become your own doctor with the information right. out there today. Exactly. You should not trust anybody to tell you about your health, but you take control of your personalized health care. Mm -hmm. No, no doubt about it. Read my book. Read the mm -hmm. books that we talk about. That's a great book, Forks Over Knives. There's no question. There are doctors out there that are not part of the system, but you do have to seek them out. Exactly, exactly. Oh. So, yeah, Rex, I'm glad you brought the vaccination thing up because that's a really hot-button topic, and we really should spend as much time as we are on it. I mean, we obviously – we talked about it on the show right before you got on. Vaccines are the biggest scam going, I mean, other than the nanites. You know, the, it, it really <laughs> is disgusting how – how it, it just it's part and parcel it's like it's it's immersed in our system now to the point that you can't even avoid it if you have children no. well and how do you get around the fact that most people are so ignorant when i say ignorant i just mean uninformed right you get you can't get around stupid either so you combine the the low iq with people and their conditioning and i'm not you know there's some very intelligent people out there i know that many people that listen to gerald jay matthew a lot of people listen to leak project they're astute man i've talked to literally rocket scientists that yeah. listen to the project and and gerald clark builds lasers so he's a pretty <laughs> smart guy Matthew's wrote some amazing books and you're right. like the top of your filled with testosterone replacement you know how to i mean you look awesome at 45 you know most people at 18 are, are eating tacos and they're 30 <laughs> pounds over and don't you Literally. I mean, it's, right. it's crazy. You, you look at this dilapidated idiocracy society right. and uh, yeah, we need to start waking people up. So it's good when we can do these conversations, I think, because even though we've hit on some of the dark side of what's going on, we're also hitting on a lot of the, the light that, that Gerald brought up. Be a part of the light. Bring light into the darkness. Be the change. I mean, you're right. I mean, this is, we are giving actionable, engaging, real life strategies that people can take home today you know, with their family, their friends, or even, you know, even just people in their network, because you're right. I mean, guys, I cannot stress it more. I, you know, and then there's the people out there and we all know them because we have them. There are friends in our social networks and whatnot who, who, who go after us when we start talking bad stuff about vaccinations because they use the math. Vaccinations aren't harmless. I mean, it's just, it's vaccinations are evil. End of story. Um, let's try, so this, this transitions into the next question, which I know a lot of people have begged us to answer and it's going to go crazy and Rex going to have to put on his alien shapeshifter outfit. He might have to shapeshift himself, but I already did the, the, awesome. <laughs> the, the, the question, the question is, is so how do you catalog the dark brothers? And again, the dark brothers, if you've read the Emerald tablets, if you're familiar with any of the stuff yeah. that Bob talks about. Um, thought the Atlantean, then you know who the Dark Brothers are, the Dark Brotherhood. You know who the White yeah. Brotherhood is. So I want to talk about that. Who are the Dark Brothers? And I'll let Matt start. And all of us are going to talk. And I know Gerald has a lot to say about this matter. Now, listen, I don't want people watching the show to lose their minds when we're talking about this. But this is truly the crux of the battle between light and dark. You know, exactly. I hate saying good versus evil because that's kind of the bullshit metaphor. It's light and dark, and light resonates as airy and light and easy, and dark resonates as heavy. This doesn't sense, for those of us who are aware. So go ahead, Matt. You got the first um, thing. There, the construct of this, of this you know, creator of all holographic design is based entirely on duality. You can see it in every aspect of, every de of almost every decision that's made, the extremes on every end. And, and just like that, it seems that life – and the priorities of, 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 of which side you focus on follow that duality as well. And this darker side of, of light to, to counter light, there are alliances and beings throughout the galaxy and universe who have clearly chosen a darker side. The, the, you know, the, in, in Star Wars, they, they, it's, the, it's the path, the, the dark side. Right. And, all the, and all that is is the, the idea of completely 
giving in to um, the dom the idea of dominating others, you know, using them as resources, taking control. Service of self. There's, yeah, so these beings and, and these alliances who have taken over various large swaths of the galaxy, whatever it is, they decided at one point, and what, what, I've, what I've seen looking in the research, this, this dividing point where he, um, both human cultures and, and maybe the, the higher gods of the Anunnaki, there were these, there were these sides that were, that were decided. And um, when, I was, when I was looking through this research, um, in several different places from the Emerald Tablets you mentioned, all the way up through uh, the, our, the ancient, ancient Sumerian t um, writings, they talk about how there's this, there was this dark side of this corrupted dark side that, that can kind of infuse and kind of um, polluted itself within humanity. Thoth the Atlantean talks about that, how there were these dark beings that were contacted from some kind of another, another realm, and they, they were allowed in. And, and, that, and that always fascinated me. But one of the things that's strange about it is, if you start looking at the evidence of, of those who have influenced us, you see overwhelming evidence of the Anunnaki. But you see very, very little on any, any of the Syrian or Orion darker side, which I believe they are. And from what mm. I've um, researched and looked into, it's because they simply are masters of not being known. Right. They are like... They they rem they want to remain totally hidden. They they want to be behind the scenes pulling the strings. Well, well, Thoth, Thoth refers to them, and not to interrupt you. And I know Joe has a ton to talk about on this, but and, and I want you to get back. But Thoth refers to them as the serpent beings. Yeah, and, and says yeah. there is a word that can, you know, get rid of the ruse or the you know the the shape shifting or the you know the holographic you know face that they pro they project. Right, right, Gerald. Yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of an interesting part of uh, Thoth's discussions. He never gave us the actual word to right. unmask their countenance, but if you think about the movie, they live where they actually put sunglasses on <laughs> and they can see them. I mean, that, that would be even better, right? So you can see them and them not know that you know that the, who they are because you don't, you're not saying anything to alert them, right? So go, go back to Matt. But, so, so let me just define this for the people that are watching this that don't have the understanding of this that we have. So all of you guys have seen all these Hollywood shows. They live, Gerald just runs to them, V, you know, V part two. It always stems somewhere, somehow to draconians, dragons, reptilians, yes. lizard mm -hmm. people, lizard people, dino people, reptoids, reptilians, whatever you want to call them. There's, they're immersed in our... In, in, in like the myth, the mythology of our human experience, and, and, and again from Hollywood through mythology through so many things. You know, we have you know tablets. They found dino men right in the cuneiform or in, yeah. you know, buried in the pyramids and stuff like that. And, and obviously in Mexico too. And mm -hmm. the Quetzalcoatl. There's there's so much stuff that has this lizard, you know, symbolism. This lizard man, lizard woman symbolism. So I you know setting that up. Go back, Matt. Talk again still about these people. The, the symbology is incredible throughout our culture, right? We see, we have this idea of dragons and giants and everyone thinks they're just myths and that they're not based on anything. And yet, if you look at star constellations, you see something, the idea that there's a constellation called Alpha Draconis. Right. And then, boom, wow, Draconis sounds a lot like dragon, doesn't it? Right. And, right. and all these other various things. And draconian, draconian, draconian. Yeah. draconian. Exactly, and so if, if everything is based on this duality, then if mammals exist on the blue vibrational frequency at one end of the light spectrum, then reptiles would, would exist on the other, and that's what right. forms the duality, I think, in the universe, is this, this polarization of both sides where one with, that has a, maybe that has developed to have lost all connections to its emotional side and have, have then decided to focus it all on their intellectual side and the gain of themselves – They've left that path, and that's the dark path. That's the red vibrational conscious path, whereas this, this blue path, I think, it's, it's the idea of um, the collaboration and furthering those around you. And so this battle of polarity and duality is, is what is ruling everything. And so who are these darker ones? Right. I want to I read a quick quote that I have. Um, there's something that Gerald has talked about many, many times called it's the, anonymous, the anonymous Enki message. And it's just this message we've received, which, which has basically a message to humanity right now and kind of what's going on. And it has so many different aspects to it that are impossible to be somebody just writing it based on um, a fun joke. Because there are terms that someone would have to know the most 
ancient aspect of, of ancient history to, to really understand terms that are just not used. Right. And in this message, there's this one part where he actually talks about who these darker beings are. And I wanted to read it. Mm -hmm. And it says in this paragraph, it mentions, but deceivers who seek harm upon you have taken the roles in the upper echelons of your society. Right. Together with Marduk, one of the, the great the sons and one of the great rulers we talked about previous, have created alliances with beings not of Anunnaki nor of mankind. Mm -hmm. Your leaders have become vessels for these beings, yes. and their bodies are operating not of their control. There is no empathy, reason, or negotiating with them, your leaders, because they are no longer retaining their human spirit. This is why all of your leaders appear to age so quickly. The life energy inside of them is quickly drained by these entities, right. and their life essence is removed and merged with the life essence of the dark ones. So, mm -hmm. right. so we quickly, just really quickly, look at Congress and on how we've yes. had in this older in echelons of our society these 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 um these kind of ancient, why are there no ancient, term limits for our senators? And they continue. Why does all this occur? Yeah, yes. they continue Listen. to perpetuate this 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 continuous mentality that never seems to change. Go ahead, Gerald. Talk about. Well, that. I was going to say, you know, um, Thoth also mentioned. Uh, in Atlantis, when these uh, power-hungry individuals decided to open a portal to a lower dimension, right. lower dimension to bring these beings into their space, as part of a control, I think it was like a control issue. Well, if that's the case, he also said that they're usually summoned where the rights and the blood are off. Yes. You've got a ritual that exactly. involves blood, whether it's symbolic or not. Yeah. Those beings can be summoned. So I take you to Bohemian Grove. Yes. Anybody that's Luciferianism. Anybody that's involved with those rituals, guess what? They've offered up their body as yes. vessels for these beings to occupy them, and that's what's going on. The same thing exactly. with the pedophilia. Yeah. It creates the same genetic memory from the blood, from the breaking of you know the hymen or anal sex or any of that. All of that that pheromonal. Um, you know, the encalphic, all those mis responses, those biological response mechanisms, all of that is doing that. You're right. It's stemming or it's bringing mm. forth these, whatever you want to call them, you want to define them as serpent beings, demon demonic forces, Luciferian, whatever. Mm. And you're right. And, and, and I, I know this sounds crazy and, you know, Rex is going to attack me here in a second. I know Rex has a lot to talk about this because he always asks the question on millions of his shows. But I... I, I truly, deeply believe that they are in control of the majority of our leaders. I'll tell you one guy, mm -hmm. every time I look at the guy, he never dies. He's been around forever. It's like something is possessing him. And I'm probably sure there is. But that guy, Henry Kissinger, for Christ's sake. He's been talked about many times. He looks like a dragon. Excuse my language. I'm trying to clean up my language, but I have so much passion by that. When I look at Henry Kissinger, he literally looks like a dragon in human form. Well, look at, look, at, look at how the leaders uh, get their energy sapped just to correlate with what Anki is saying in that message. Like, look, at, look at Hillary Clinton. She can look at Obama. Walk, she can hardly walk up the steps. Look at, yeah. So, you know what? When you, offer, humans, right? when you offer yourself up to be used that way, you know, uh, you ought to be able to look to your peers and go, gosh, it's happening to them. Why would I do that? What is the allure to these people to want to sell their souls. So let me, let me say something real quick and then Rex jump in. I don't get it. I, I, let me just say something real quick. We're going to have a lot of people that are going to watch this and a lot of this, a lot of people who are like us in our group and aware are going to, this is going to resonate and they're going to be blown away by what we're talking about. But the people that are not as aware, and you're not ready yet and it's not, no judgment of you. You're not aware yet. This doesn't resonate with you. You're not going to understand what we're talking about and you're going to think we're crazy. But that's fine. It's okay. But when you get to a certain level, and yeah. you do see that stuff, and you've read as much as all of us have, and you've interviewed as many people who have talked about this in first person as Rex has heard. This is not crazy, guys, okay? When you read Thoth's Emerald Tablets, and you read them every night, as Gerald says, and you make them a part of your life, and you understand, and the words, like, literally harmonize, and they resonate, that, you know, there's like, a, there's like a, a, a chord, like a resonant frequency that it just charges your body when you're reading it. This is not bullshit. This is legit. These beings are running things. They are inhabiting the souls or the life force of people in power on our planet. 
Yeah. This is not crazy. I am not crazy when I say this. I well, believe this. Well, listen, the idea that humans are avatars, I want to bring that up one more time. Right. We are meat hosts that have energy that can animate us. Yes. It can be, it can be used, if, right? if you haven't taken the responsibility to own those energy centers that control you, then guess what? There's seven of them that other entities can walk in and control you at any level. So maybe you get your five fifth chakra on, but guess what? There's still two above that. Yes. Entities can control you. So until you cast out all seven demons like Jesus did to Mary Magdalene and wake up all your chakras, you're vulnerable. And then one other thing I want to add, and then Rex, jump in. I know you have a lot to say. When you've done DMT, as have I, multiple times, I have seen these beings. Now, no, I have not had conversations or sat on a teeter-totter with them and talked to them about, you know, the algebraic expressions of the universe, but I have seen these beings in my flying, hurtling through the vastness of whatever, and they exist, and I cannot comprehend what they are, where they are, how they are, but Gerald is right, and we are just avatars in a simulation, and we are energy bodies, and these things can sap onto our energy. And I have friends, and all of you guys do, and Daniel Kelly could talk about this, and Matt, you had Daniel Kelly on your show. Daniel Kelly saw one of these beings when he was 26 years old or 25 years of his life in his room standing at the foot of his bed, and it wanted into him. And he thought he was dreaming the whole thing, and he had no idea where he was at his place now where he's level of seeking. But that's what led him into this. He's like, Jay, I have seen this being. It made itself known to me. It sat at the foot of my bed. It was eight feet tall and it had, you know, menacing looking at me. So the reality of that people do see this, you know, again, depending on your expression, depending on your awareness levels and where you're at in your life, some people they manifest to. I remember listening to Jordan Maxwell, which Rex has had him on his show. And Jordan Maxwell is scared shitless at this stage of his life because he's been threatened by so many who knows type forces in the universe. But he has an amazing story about when he had one of these reptilian beings appear to him and basically say, you need to shut up or you're going to go missing. And that, that resonated so deeply with me. I was like 16 or 17 years old when I heard that story from him. I was listening. I think it was on a radio show way back. You know, Again, this is 20 plus years ago. But I'm telling you, we're not crazy. Rex, what do you, what do you have to say on this? Certainly when you look at people that have a lot of control and you see the world today the way that it is, it makes you wonder, you know, what is causing this? Could human beings create such havoc and chaos? And I don't and, believe and they why, can. Why would they? Well, you know, I mean, certainly I, I have never seen a reptilian shapeshifter. And if I have, I certainly don't remember it. So, you know, I must have not had my Ray-Bans on when I got zapped. I forget <laughs> about it. <laughs> so, but I, there's definitely a lot of information out there. And I've seen statues that are supposedly 7,000 years old, approximately, right. of giant reptilian people. Gargoyles. And you can go, yeah, I mean, the gargoyles. And there's a lot of stuff out there that kind of points to the possibility. And if you look at dinosaurs and, you know, when they supposedly died out, well, right. did they? And did they yeah. possibly evolve from dinosaurs? Did they create dinosaurs? I mean, there's so many possibilities. What I would say also is another possibility and this would be a more rational one, but not at the same time, is what if this entire thing is somewhat of like a, a hoax in a sense to where maybe it's all humans and the people that are doing this stuff have certain security clearances or, or can, can basically get away with just about anything and they blame it on the reptilian agenda or they blame it on these, these ancient relics. Now, I'm not, and I'm not saying that's the case and I'm not saying... Either way, it just what seems a, as what, a, what a segue, Rex. Uh, well, I, I agree with you, Rex. I, I, think was more I didn't, I didn't share real info. I didn't share with him the email I sent you today, Jay, about stumbling across this article of this yeah. guy, this guy, this doctor who's a physicist and living in Florida that's accusing the telecom companies of allowing them to broadcast frequencies that are messing with humans, right? Did you Amazing. see? Oh, my God. So, I ran up and I saw this and I was like, I've been saying this for years, right? In my first book, I talked about entrainment. You just I proved was, it. You just well, proved it. So, you know, and I knew there were patent positions, but until I actually went and saw the patent myself and read through it, I'm like, okay, yeah. The, and this is what, the, that patent was dated 1992. 
Rex, I think I think what you just hit is right. I think there's more disinfo than there is actual info. But uh, along with what you also said, there's too many mentions. There's too many historical records of quote unquote reptilian, draconian, dragon. There's just there's too much of it, and there's also a lot of oil companies, a lot of ancient old money. You know, uh, hair, uh, you Sinclair. Know, hair, exactly, Sinclair. I mean. I mean, yeah, I was going to speak to those families after. There, actually, there's yeah. so much of that in our lineage of our, you know, again, of our historical record. And again, much of our historical record <laughs> probably be. Well, you, you know how Gerald just said, maybe we're in a simulation, right? Okay, so let's look at that possibility. When you look at quantum physics, if you look at matter underneath an electron microscope, it would certainly appear that we're in some type of simulation. Absolutely. Well, okay, if that's the case, well, then how do we know any of it's? what it is anymore. Maybe all that stuff that we're actually obtaining through our DNA is just coded information from when we were in a different time and a different place. And this whole thing could Agreed. be just a grand Agreed. illusion. Like when you, you bring up Jordan Maxwell, when he was on the show the other day, he was talking about how Steven Spielberg, well, he's got a friend that used to be friends. You know, it's like everybody has a friend that's got a friend that's got a friend that's got an uncle. But right. anyway, he has a friend that is friends with Steven Spielberg or was. And one day he saw him offset he was in a golf cart, essentially. Oh, God, he shape-shifted. Well, he tried to get, this, this guy tried to catch up with him, and he, he realized when he was about 15 feet behind him that Steven Spielberg didn't look all the way back, but he did partially, didn't realize that he was there, just realized somebody was there. And then he looked up, Steven Spielberg supposedly looks up, and then these literally men in black essentially pop out of nowhere, like a hologram, pop out of nowhere, and there's his security guards are there all of a sudden. This guy finally catches up to the security guards. And he's like, hey, I'm friends with Steven. Let me talk to him. They're like, no, no, you need to go away. Go away. Wow. So the guy turns around. He's going away. And then he looks back. And they're gone. Just totally believe they're it. Gone. Totally, like they, totally believe it. You guys have seen the story that Dan Aykroyd has about his little black men. In, uh, he, he brought up the Dan Aykroyd story. Yeah. Because everything's Dan based Aykroyd, on something. Dan Aykroyd right? story, I've watched the Dan Aykroyd story 20 times. I watched it within the first six months that it appeared on YouTube. I've actually met Dan Aykroyd in person about oh, 12 years awesome, ago. Oh, that's awesome, man. He's one of my favorite actors. Dan, listen, Dan, I shared, a, I shared a private box suite um, when I worked. This is a long time ago. When I worked um, for Kelly Blue, with Kelly Blue Book as a senior VP a long time ago um, at the racetrack in Fontana with Dan Aykroyd. And Dan Aykroyd is... 100% legit, stand up, not controlled. He's on the side, he's on the mm -hmm. light side. There's no doubt. Mm -hmm. and this is right when he was starting to have his experiences. And he told me about his show. And Rex, maybe you know this, but you guys know he produced a show and they did 11 episodes. And it also was cut and completely wiped out from Sci Fi Channel. And it was, he, I mean, he did, he went, this is way before, you know, Jesse uh, Ventura's conspiracy show. And he had, according to what he told me, he had 11 episodes already wrapped in the hopper produced and everything that were mesmerizing that was going to blow the roof off of the conspiracy about quote unquote UFOs. This is again, like literally 13, 12 or 13 years ago. And they kiboshed it. Yeah. Show never saw the light. Magic yet. number 11. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Never, never, never saw the light of day. I'm not surprised about that at all. So, so I mean, but back to the whole reptilians and the dark brotherhoods. I mean, Rex, you know, um, great devil's advocate, you know, statement because he's pro probably right. But I think it actually it resonates a little bit with me from the standpoint of what he said. And Gerald, speak to this um, about the waking up. You know, what if what if it is true? What if we are all in a simulation, and now some of us, you know, the five percent or the ten percent or of us that are waking up and are becoming aware. You know, our chakras are tuned. We're you know our energy balance is there. What if we are waking up and we're finding out that we're not from here? You know, that again, you're going to this Saul, this Avalon Saul being, and we're, we're realizing that, like, holy shit, you know, we're on Earth, and where is Earth? We're lost. So, so there is some truth to what Rex is saying. There is a possibility that we are souls that have been brought here, as you guys have both said a million times, that Earth is a prison planet. And it's now, been Jay, real quick, though, what happens if we wake up and then we look at ourselves underneath a microscope? Is it still going to look the same? <laughs> right. Well, and this this brings up the great, great question, dude. This brings up the uh, great question about the three matrix series. You know, we start out with the first one: what is the matrix? Number two, uh, why are, why are we in the matrix? And number three, what what's the way out? Is there a, is there a way out? 
okay? You have to really ask yourself. In the third matrix, Neo got to go meet the grand system architect Yeah. in order to, but guess what? He had to be incorporated into the constructs of the matrix. He never got out. No. The matrix was reloaded and they incorporated what they learned from him back into re re-engineering a new form of the matrix to maintain the simulation it doesn't listen i think the creator of all actually is running the top level simulation i agree with that and the two basic rules are time and the law of creation of matter and then underneath that i think the anunnaki have gone to different planets set up who knows what a dodecahedron energy field around that planet so that they can control the consciousness and everything else so there's simulations within simulations, essentially. Exactly. And they're not, they're not even sure what they're part of. I, I really, mm -hmm. when I look at this story so many times, because it's just this huge story of, you know, us coming from these, this primitive, primitive worker aspect, it, it just seems to me that the creator of all's um, matrix of what this construct is, um, those <laughs> below them that think they're gods like Enlil and those who think they're in control they're actually just serving the greater the greater plan all along well, some of them some of them know that and as a matter of fact if you go back to who the dark prince of arulu is i believe it's enlil so right. you, had, you had enki and enlil at the two top positions one controlling the light clan and one controlling the dark clan right and i true and i think they may even at certain times in, in swap they may even swap because this is part of the playing out the duality experience for the humans i think that's the balance huh? you gotta have creation and destruction i think balance. that's the easiest way for for quote unquote consciously aware people which i consider all of us to be i think that's the easiest way for us in our 3d constructs brains you know the non the, the one fifth the iq of the anunnaki or one tenth the iq of the anunnaki the, the reality is is that we can't quantify it based on our understanding of, uh, again, of our 3D, you know, construct. I mean, we, we, we really can, and that makes the most sense. But I know that when smart people come at me and say, well, wait a minute, if Enki and Thoth are light beings, then, you know, how can they be swapping and playing the game? But it's like Gerald says, if it ultimately is a simulation, I still keep mm -hmm. going back to Jason and the Argonauts. No, right? oh, wonderful, wonderful comparison. Yeah, yeah. So, so here we are, we're on the chessboard, and Zeus mm -hmm. is over here, and Apollo is over here. <laughs> they're just, they're just, moving the pieces back and forth and we're the chimeras and it's just that's the best way to truly think about this is i mean we're just the game to them we're, well, the, exactly. you, know, you, you remember the you remember the scene where um hera is discussing with the king right. who had invaded this kingdom and he said i did it on behalf of zeus zeus yes. told me to do it right yes she goes no you did it of your own will right and then it comes down to the conversation of well, why, why is this going on? Why are you guys monitoring yeah. us and, and treating us like pawns? Because it can. And she says, it's so that man will know himself and that the gods may know him. Exactly. In other words, this is a lesson for you to figure, you're out, smart enough your to figure state, it out your state of awareness. And at the same time, it lets us who are monitoring this use you as the heroes in these different scenarios to be an example so we can convey messages to all of mankind. This is and, the but, right. But ultimately it's up to you. Right. But ultimately it's up to you to figure out your mission parameters. Exactly. And this is, <laughs> and I, by the way, I have to recommend to everybody who hasn't seen Jason and the Argonauts, watch the 1963. I was going to say the original, the original. The 1963 version where Jason is this doubting Thomas who doesn't even believe there are gods, right? Yeah. How many of us are there in the world today that are like yes. that, right? Yes. So this movie is for all the Jasons in the world. And, and, I, and because of his doubting, but his willingness to be a hero, he had a code of belief and behavior that went beyond some doctrine from someone else. He was just a hero. He's a good guy, absolutely. right? And, Go ahead, Rex. And they recognized his archetype and used him to wake him up. I thought it was fantastic. Totally fantastic. It, you know, Clash of the Titans tried to pick up after that. And it was, you know, Harry, Har it was Harry, Harry, Harryhausen. Harryhausen and Harry Hamlin. Yeah, it was yeah. the actor. Um, but go ahead, Rex. Oh, I just want to say it's fascinating. Even if you go back 60 years, and you, even more than that with film, and some of the, the movies that have been made, the screenplay, the, the scripts that were written, 
are timeless. Literally, you can look at it yeah. seven mm-hmm. years from now, 100 years from now, and the archetypes that were portrayed, you don't realize at the time, you can go back and watch it when you're in a different place in your life because of the information that you've obtained, right. and you'll get something completely different. Ho- Hollywood is truly a cipher, as Matt said on his show last week, you know, him mm-hmm. and Jason and Daniel, and as we said in week two when we talked about Hollywood and their control of consciousness. I think this is a perfect seed right now to move into the final question, and you know, we, can, we can add some little things if we want a final comment. We've, we've been on about 90 minutes, but the fourth question is, what is CERN really doing? Um, anybody want to take it first? I'll jump in real quick yeah, that wrecks and then I'll, then I'll let you guys take over because I don't have a whole lot of information on CERN, but what I do have is even better. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay. So a family member of mine passed away a short while ago and I hope he's in a much better place now, but the person that I met after he passed is related to him. His name is Lance and this gentleman actually <clears throat> made certain equipment and has certain patents that are involved with CERN and CERN like technology. He actually worked at the facility in Texas before it was closed down. Wow. That is CERN. So I am going to have an interview with him in just a few weeks because he lives out by Dallas. Nice. Basically family. Very cool. That's all I have. Oh man, you suck. More, more coming soon. More coming soon. So stay tuned. Leakproject.com. I want to do a couple of things that I've noticed about CERN. First of all, um, we can talk about scientifically about what they're doing in accelerating paired electrons and smashing each other. I don't think we need to go to that level of detail. No, we don't need to talk particle physics. It sounds but, awesome. Well, I, I would love to sometime. But, and I'd also like to do a show and talk about what's going on with the uh, laser interferometer at Caltech and measuring the gravity wave. That's right up my alley, okay? But anyway. Awesome. Bingo. Uh, what I noticed about CERN was, first of all, it started out with the Fermi Lab in Chicago. This is where the where they first started doing underground part. Right, of it. right. And when I saw the one in Europe, I was like, "Wow, this one is really big." You know what's going on here? <clears throat> and uh, the symbology kind of drew me in to pay a little closer attention to what they were up to. First of right. all, their logo is very disturbing with triple sixes. Yes. Um, the fact that they've affiliated with uh, Kali, the, dis- the goddess of destruction, uh, in, their, in their dance. And listen, there was a book that came out way back when that you guys may not be aware of. It was called uh, uh, Tao and the Dancing Wooly Masters, which was a discussion about the nature of particle physics. Right. Okay? And there was another one in Search of Schrodinger's Cat and several other books in the esoteric physics space. And if you had read those and seen what they're doing at CERN, you'd go, wait a second, yeah, guys. I know. I know. Okay, so the bottom line for me is um, looking at the nature of energy and dimensions. Um, I believe that dimensions are uh, categorized by frequency. and that Yeah, I do too. And that if you could put your brain on that frequency, you could experience a dimension shift, right? This is sure. what I, this was like. So I think they have discovered that. Um, through a high energy impact collision that they can essentially create an energetic space that allows them to bridge over to other dimensions. And this was written, this was written. about Absolutely. So are they opening wormholes strategically or is it just a byproduct of what they're messing around with? Well, I think it was a functional uh, capability that they needed to have so they could move large right. resources on and off planets as part of their colonizing efforts. Absolutely. And I think it's, and the fact that it's in Switzerland. Exactly, exactly, exactly. This tunnel ceremony, and it's all about gold. I think it all has to do about <laughs> moving yeah. some transition metals off of this planet to another location that they want them. Is, isn't it always that they give you kind of a story that is like a, a side purpose of what the real purpose is all along? So it's like we're doing this for this reason, but this is only like a byproduct of what the actual purpose is all well, I think, yeah. Well, I that think, ritual that Gerald's talking about, though, I mean, that was very mm-hmm. uncovering. They showed a lot. And you a can lot of esoteric metaphor. The esoteric. Exactly. And I think, I think what they're doing, they've taken the technology they discovered at CERN, and they put it underground in a tunnel where you can't see it, just like the yeah. CERN's underground, where they can access it with vehicles, large trucks, and whatever. Because I think they're actually using it to transport stuff, truly. That's that. and, and it has to be such that they can move it from 
this dimension to another one, to another location. You know, that's so wall, crazy to think about. Uh, well, listen, if the Anunnaki were here to get gold, and Nibiru might be coming back by, and they've amassed all this gold in Switzerland, and now they've got a tunnel where they go hide it away, right. and they do a crazy ceremony to tell you that the portal's opening, and this is, and these miners, look, it, put two and two together. They're, right. They're here, they've been stealing your gold, and now they're taking it off planet before it gets back. But, 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 what, but wouldn't it be logical, Gerald, and I agree all, with all that, of course. I do too. I do too. But, what, but wouldn't it be logical to think the Anunnaki being such an advanced race, and now you know we're 500,000 years later, uh, and who knows where we are from a space-time standpoint? You know, we're talking 3D linear years and in, in age. But 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 wouldn't it be wouldn't it be responsible? I guess to 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 believe that they're everywhere. They've got camps and you know locations on every quote unquote habitable planet. You know, within you know how many light years that they're able to travel dimension. Well, well, if the Anunnaki don't, I think some other race would. I think Star Wars is reality. Of course, it, uh, but yeah. I would assume that they're the 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 everywhere. I would assume that if we're looking at you know, and again, this is maybe a, a great subject for another show. But if we're if we're quantifying the star races. You know, you know, you know, through a through a graph, a, a working graph. I mean, I I'm with you, Gerald. I mean, the Anunnaki are at the top of the food chain. They're right below the creator of all. They, well, they might not some, be of them, some, of, some of them are. I think I think uh, the ones that are working with the seven cycle masters, and I think that's yes. Hop and Enki, definitely, and probably Isis too. And, well, listen, they mentioned who they were. There was Isis and Osiris and. Anu, right? Anu's there. Yeah, they mentioned uh, in the when you get through the duot, when the twelve houses that were there, the beings that were in there, and who was guarding what. So these are the old. Some of them are the old Egyptian gods. Okay, right, Osiris. Yeah. Some of them are clearly working very closely with whoever these cycle masters are that are not Anunnaki. These right. are a higher dimension than even they are. Yes. So what and dimension? What dimension? Let me put you on the spot. Are they sixth, seventh? Well, they tell you what dimension they are. They tell you they go from three to nine. Right. So, but no, but those no, specific ones. Three. No, so, all of those dimensional realities, the reason they're in charge of our dimension is because those, those are axes in our chakras that are available to us. Right. right. The number three maps to your first chakra, and number nine maps to your seventh chakra. So the so the cycle masters the nine cycle masters there would they would be at the ninth level I would assume correct well I think the ninth cycle master would probably be at the same dimensional level when you read at the ninth level in the uh, Emerald Tablets if you look at my holographic yeah for chart, sure the ninth level was where the creator of all existed alone remember so these these cycle masters have to be direct agents of the creator of all the creator of all right below higher than the Anunnaki and most other races too. And, and, and here's, a, here's a really amazing aspect to look at. We look at ancient Atlantis and how um, Thoth talks about how Atlantis was this utopian civilization who became corrupted by this dark, these darker ones, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas I want to direct to some of Gerald's fantastic writing where he talks about how the, the, the Biru civilization themselves may have been a great utopian advanced um, creator of all civilization who then became also corrupted Corrupted. just like Atlantis and the Earth by Makes this darker sense. side, and that's why we oh. still retain this this divinity within the Anunnaki on this fragmented level from Enki, Ningshida, all the way up through um, um, every aspect of that light side. But then we see um, branching out uh, past Anu, we see Enlil and, and that whole side, and it turns of a much darker uh, road. I see these two divergent sides of the Nibiru ancient. Um, genealogy timetables it's really interesting isn't it gerald yeah you know the one that really just kind of comes to my mind right now that i i really never knew that much about anu other than his interaction with the adapa during the adapa tale right. yeah right. Um, his sh he shows up a little bit in the atrahasis where he seems to be on the side of the miners where he right right but when you go to the city of ur and i this this is like a darker side of him that i do not get yeah it's clear that Anu and Enlil were in a council meeting, and they decided to destroy the city of Ur, where Nanar, his son, was living with right. all these people. What justification could you have for that kind of genocide? I think it was just to get rid of the primitive workers. I, I ever, but why? Well, what, what, what was special about them? Why could you? How could you justify just saying, "Okay, you're gone," and and to be that callous toward the humans? So I have a different. 
opinion of Anu because of that. And I've never been, been able to get past that. It, it seems like it, um, Nibiru and the people there became a, a military commander civilization rather than one that was based on uh, kind mm-hmm. of the collective evolution of its, of its species. Mm-hmm. And that really hierarchy, that hierarchy structure shows itself in our own kingship that then took over on the earth, I think. I think what you saw in the movie Battlefield Earth right. was very accurate in how those Anunnaki beings were shown relating to humans. I, I think that was actually some of them, especially the ones that treated them as primitive worker slaves that, you know. Uh, Look at the way the natives got treated here, you know. I mean, they, yeah. got, treated, they got slaughtered like oh, shit. And I was, I, animals. And I want to say, having lived in a different country now for a while, I'm telling you what, there's a very soft place in my heart for what's been done to these people here. For the indigenous, oh, yeah. Me too, me too. Not only the indigenous, but everybody that has been subsumed under the sword and their culture taken away, and they've been caught up. Listen, there's nobody speaking Mayan. Right. You're right. They're being wiped out. They're speaking yeah. the language of the conquerors. Their rituals and customs and their religion are, the, are all given to them by the conquerors. Such these, a sad these story. These are enslaved enslaved people and listen it's man. sad it's really sad it really is well i in fact gerald it's so funny you're so right when i went down to the pyramids you know north of tulum the giant massive one and i took all those pictures back in november of last year before you and i knew each other but um just speaking to them and i think it's the toltecs i think it was the toltecs of that pyramid um you know there the are very few of them but they are so conditioned and you're right they come from an inculcated mindset of because I was talking to them about, like, you know, who their forefathers and their ancestors were. And, oh, no, sir, they, you know, there's no aliens or there's no advanced species. We were just, you know, a small indigenous pygmy group. Yeah, they're, it's truly sad what has been done to them. Yeah, it really is. And some of them, you know, there's a lot of waking up going on in Mexico. At least they've disclosed. Uh, I see that, too. Those. But at the same time, when you look at where the general consciousness is because of, and I'm going to say it right now, and, and Moro Bellino will agree with me, is what the – the Papa, the Catholic Church has done to this country is disgusting. The world. It makes, world. Me, it makes me sick to see how disempowered they've been spiritually because of that organization. Yeah. And they target, they target poor countries because I know, man. When the education level is low. It's easy to get victims. That's how I That's see it. I want to throw in one more thing about CERN because you brought up a good point, Gerald. And I want to ask your opinion on this. If the Anunnaki had the technology, wormhole type technology, wouldn't they also have the technology to move the planet, you know, create a wormhole, move the planet from point A to point B, keep it at a certain location. Now, here's, here's why I'm going this route, because if you really think about how Nibiru has this orbit where it causes mass chaos with all these other planets, I would think that it would be chaos on Nibiru too. I mean, there's got to be just as much destruction going on there. So maybe they've got some type of tech if this is all in play, that they can actually just move it from point A to point B. There are B. a lot of people that believe that, Rex. Well, you know, in Nanki's message, he says he's messing with the magnetic flux of the Earth to counteract the perturbations caused by Nibiru. Is that and true? Said, and he says for the first time, too. That's why Matt actually believes we're not all going to die. That's right. right Matt? Well, I you think- know, uh, you listen, I think Nibiru has come by... How many times before and the earth is still here and there's still every 3,600 years, right? Ah, we're not all going to die. There's going to be cataclysms. Okay. <laughs> but that's just part of the nature of the, the reality of this. I, I, I was, I was, I was, it was, it was, a meta, it was, it was a, what do you call it? And a, a metaphor. It wasn't, I, I know we never all die. Everybody survives. I mean, a fraction survive always. Um, but yeah, I mean, we don't know. I mean, there's so much stuff going on right now. Well, Enki, um, Enki tells us to understand who we are. Right. Yeah. What our mission is, why we're here, where we're going. And when you do that, listen, the, there is no external thing that could ever frighten you. Exactly. Do not your energy, your energy, that's right, because your energy is eternal. Well, you're yeah. only an avatar here and having a material experience. Well, well, you're going to go on after this. I still think so. if, you know, if we look at just the last 100 years or the last 120 years, and, you know, we all talked about this on the last show, but I think the, the, the proof that things are changing is that we haven't nuked ourselves into oblivion and the nukes haven't been allowed to go off or land or detonate. Not to say that they still can't, you know, obviously we have Albert Pike, you know, looming in the background in his story and, you know, the war to end all wars and the war to end all religions. And it's always a possibility, but I just, 
you know, I want to, maybe I'm hoping beyond hope, but I really do want to believe that there are alter, ulterior forces or, and motives in the background preventing humanity or sapiens sapiens from destroying itself. And Absolutely. We, we definitely know that we have. I mean, World War I was a war of disease and starvation and mass death and casualty. And then right after World War I, we had the Spanish flu. And then right after the Spanish flu, we had World War II. You know, and we had the Stalin purge and we had Hitler. And, and it, we've just been killing each other and killing ourselves and destroying ourselves for millennia. And, and now, all of a sudden, it's not happening. Yes, there's still skirmishes and yes, there's still hundreds of thousands of people dying in countries, but we're not exterminating ourselves at a level that we once did. And it's like, it's like different hands that have been in play, right? You talk about that chess match using right. humanity. I see that chess match as determining where our timeline will go. So it's a Ted chess match to say, we're going to play, we're going to play the game this way to, to push humanity into this outcome. Whereas we're going to push it this outcome. And, and I see um, earth in this prison planet of, of, of humans on this, in this place, this learning aspect of duality that we're going through is being propelled by the idea that we, we, we should go one direction or another based on the interest of whatever faction at hand has the controlling view of us. Gerald talks all the time about how we're reaching this zodiacal house change. And maybe that's the whole purpose and how our history is directly lining up with these rulers of us. And so if we're getting this zodiacal house change, and then the Mayans also predicted consciousness would reach its greatest, um, greatest place in this t certain time, then they clearly knew that during these zodiacal house periods, consciousness wouldn't be able to um, raise itself. And right. so, that, so, so maybe these zodiacal house periods are pre-planned all along and it's known about. It's almost like during them, chaos can ensue. And then, and then once, once a time period moves on, which I believe we're, we're, we're entering right now, you see um, all the cards being thrown on the table and then a, 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 a hopefully a, a transition to a much better place out of the ashes of what is going to be I think a, a new start on every aspect of our, of, of what we, of what we think is um, real. I think, I think it's possible. Let me throw in a bonus question. We've been on about an hour and 45 minutes, an hour and 46 minutes now. So let's make this maybe the final question for everybody to answer. And then, um, you know, we'll, we can talk pretty. Yeah. We can talk about next week. Um, Cause you see this a lot and you, you know, some of the people ask this question too on the Facebook wall and stuff like that. Do you guys, any of you guys think that, We'll get to a point where disclosure of whatever it is, whether it's aliens or you know alternative realities or whatever, will, will it ever happen in a way that the masses just become aware all you know in a hurry? Is that even possible? What are your thoughts? Um, I, I don't think it's going to happen in that way ever. I think we, we wanted to. Those, I've used to always think it was going to. But the more that I've looked at the constructs of, what, of how information is being slowly allowed – during certain aspects right. of our media all the way through our systems. I think maybe there's an idea of where the cat's kind of already out of the bag. Right, like control. They've, right. And they've, they've agreed on both ends that for, the, for the, our growth and our stability of, of energy beings allowed with our truth coming in, we must have it come in in increments. Or we'll I, think, I, think not, I think ancient aliens is proof that you're right. Yeah. I would, uh, I would say I don't think it's going to happen as uh, incremental leaks of information. I believe that based on our constructs, and we see this happening now, and we can't really put our finger on it, but I think our meat modems are going to be exposed to energy, and it's going to reach a crescendo and a level such that everyone will respond to it based on where they are in their chakras. I agree 100%. And I think it's happening. It's happening right now. I think it's happening incrementally because it's happening – on a scale that can't be explained just from an information distribution level. To me, right. to me. You're right. No, no, no. I agree with you 100%. You know that. We've talked about that. I agree. We talked about that before the show. People are becoming aware. We all have yeah. friends that are just coming out of the woodwork and they're saying, my God, I don't even know why I know this, but what you're saying resonates so deep with me. I watch your guys' shows. I, I read the stuff that you guys post on your Facebook, blah, blah, blah. And it just, you're right. It's like once the awareness, I love, I'll give Matt's phrase, phrase. It, once the awareness of the awareness occurs in your chakras, in your mind, in your antenna, your energy being, everything changes. Mm -hmm. Awareness and, of awareness. Yeah, and you're just now this tuned, not detuned, tuned meat modem to a frequency that you never really realized you had.
but there's yeah. a time period that it has to follow. I mean, yes, it's a it is it is leaps, and especially in terms of if you look at the enormous gap of time that we've had humanity. But I mean, what I mean is like all disclosure occurring in like a week. I think what we're going to see is pieces, you know, the, because truth is like an onion, right? It's all just layers of truth. And so people aren't going to just wake up to the fact that there's a Star Wars galaxy out there that right. we're part of. They're going to wake up the, to the fact that we're conscious energy beings first. And then they're going to, then they're going to wake up to the fact that we're, um, we're being maybe controlled by a darker aspect. But by that point, I think it'll be transitioning at the same time to a better place. So it's, it's not going to be like we wake up one day and everything just crashes down and it's like, you know, the apocalypse end of, end of days. I think they know that it can't go that way because developing species would freak out if they did that. It would right. Be and out. religious people would melt down. Re exactly. Rex, thoughts, Rex, uh, uh, unraveled, unriddled disclosure immediately or just controlled delivery as we're seeing right now? Controlled delivery. In my opinion, I feel that this dimension that we're in essentially, this reality will continue to be the way that it is, except for obviously new technologies, new TV shows, new flavorings, etc. I think it's basically going to be the same in perpetuity. There's going to be these little cyclical things that take place with, like I said, technologies, yet I don't think they're ever going to fully expose the ET agenda. I think they're always going to give carrots at the end of the sticks to make people think that they are going to disclose and that they are going to wake up and then one day we're going to have this ability to shoot laser beams out of our eyeballs and fly with our hands all the way up to Pluto. But I don't think that that's going to happen, man. I think that we're in this, this makeup that we're in. If it is the matrix, this simulation is designed. This is like a, a boot camp. You make oh, yeah. it through this, then that yeah. next level, hey, maybe you do have the possibility to fly to Pluto with your hands and, and shoot people with, your, with lasers out of your eyeballs and stuff like that if they mess with you. But I just don't see it in this specific makeup. That's my opinion. Right. Agreed. I, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, Gerald, thoughts? I think, I think we're going to get surprised. I think uh, they're trying to cull you as quickly as they can because they know even though they hit you with frequencies and hit you with fluoride, dumb down your pineal gland, when this galactic energy hits that eighth latent circuit and you start waking up and you don't know why and they start reprogramming all the other circuits, the powers that be will lose control. And they know that, so they're trying to call the numbers down to the point where they can control no matter what happens to you. But, uh, you know, if we all end up on a path of waking up like Lucy, may the creator of all help them in their enslaving tactics because they're going to get their ass whipped. No doubt about Certainly it. Certainly everything's going to change. I can, I can absolutely attest and agree to that. I, I agree. <laughs> no, so. I agree. Well, guys, this is an amazing show. Let me share the screen real quick here. So for all of you guys watching and listening, again, we thank you. Um, this, this is our new Facebook group. We're probably going to change it to Decoders of Truth and not Coders of Truth. But if you want to sign up, you know, if Gerald or Rex uh, are smart, fast enough to post these things tomorrow or the day after on their YouTube channel, please feel free. We, of course, will post the uh, URL. But it's just facebook.com forward slash groups, Coders of Truth. I think it's just facebook.com, Coders of Truth. Um, and, uh, and find us and, you know, all you have to do is just ask it's public and you just ask for admission and we'll let you in. Um, you know, happy to do that. When you get in, read the, uh, start here statement so you can understand if you want to leave questions for us on a week to week basis. But, um, with that said, guys, I thought that was a really awesome show. Anybody with any final thoughts? Well, I would like to add just one thing real quick before, it sure. up tonight or before I get done talking, be the change you want to see. Absolutely, man. That's a powerful statement. You know, and if people would just do that, it would change the world, truly. I mean, I think, I mean, you guys know my thought. Matt, Rex, again, we love you, man. Thank you so much for coming on, and your, your contribution is most welcome, and uh, you're an awesome dude. Yeah, but I agree. I, you know, I, I, so I you really guys. think, yeah, of course, I really think that all four of us are doing our part. Is, as, as Gerald said, I mean, I mean, I've manifested my own reality in the last two years that if somebody would have told me four years ago what I've done, <laughs> I laughed at them. I mean, I, told, I remember standing on stage in my men's group in Santa Monica as, you know, an accomplished realtor and, you know, business guy saying, I'm writing the best book ever written on testosterone replacement therapy and people are going to recognize me for it. And they looked at me like, okay, bro, whatever. You know, and it's happened. And now I reached out to Gerald, who I thought wrote the greatest book ever on changing, you know, mankind and alternative history of like really what's going on. I sent him an email. I said, Gerald, your book resonated with me. And now look at, we're boys. 
you know? So everything that we mm -hmm. consciously manifest or want to manifest or desire to manifest, we can make possible. Mm -hmm. So Rex is right. Be the change you want to see. Manifest it. Build your relationship, you know, build your bridge, build your networks, communicate with people, bring more and more people into the group. If somebody wants to know about this, stop what you're doing and tell them. Be a teacher, you yeah. know, be a connector. I mean, I, I, I people- But don't get, be a preacher, right? Don't be a preacher, right. People, people like say to me like, hey man, I'm sorry if these are dumb questions because I know you're so advanced. I'm like, dude, I will literally talk to you until I die. I'll run my mouth for 60, 70 years until my- <laughs> my vessel burns out talking about this because this is what I live for. I want as many people as possible to at least have an awareness and an understanding of the things that I feel like we've known or that we know. And again, none of us started here. We all had to read and to seek. So continue to pursue. And you know, that's all I got. But I mean, I thought this was an amazing show. I really appreciate you guys coming on. If any of you guys want any final thoughts, feel free to step up. I just want to say um, I really appreciate, you know, all these high conscious minds. It's not every day you get to sit down with, people that can talk about these kind of topics. Um, but I think that everyone can become their own hero. And I think, I don't think mm -hmm. anyone should ever let anything s s um, stop them in, in this path. We have this incredible gift of being here in this beautiful planet with this, this um, time period to experience everything possible. Don't let anything ever stop you or hold you back. Um, <laughs> so, so just, just follow that and you will find happiness. I, I want to say one thing, even though, there's uh, four dudes here that got together that are doing this. Listen, this, these same issues are just as applicable to all the heroic women that are out there in the world. Too. And we're going to have some of them on the yeah, show. We need, we need to eventually. You know, like, uh, and I'll, I'll, I could name a lot of names right now for people <laughs> that uh, could be brought on, but uh, and maybe we, maybe we want to do that. because that's Absolutely. Next week, I think we all, yeah, I think next week we all know we identify one person right now, but there's probably 10, and I'm happy to uh, step aside and let that person come on the show, or even if it's just all five of us, I have no problem. I mean, we can, this, as you guys know, Zoom supports up to 50 participants, and it doesn't screw wow. the bandwidth. So we can, you know, we can bring on as many awesome people as we want, and we can even bring. Let me throw something out there real quick for you guys too. While you brought sure. that up, is we could also possibly do a live show on Leak Project, and I could do a, you know, an email alert so that people would know because you can do live shows on yeah, YouTube. Dude, that would be phenomenal. That would be awesome. What a great show! That and we can always, and I do them now for uh, Google Hangouts because, as you know, Rex, Google supports unlimited. Um, well, what kind of quality you get though, Jay? I, well, I did well, one of those before, and I was like. The audio quality was good, but the video was real crap. So, so here's the thing with Google Hangouts. It depends on where people are. We definitely, it's better to do a live show from like the leak project or from here and invite select people. The issue becomes when you have, you know, and obviously we have a big, all of us combined now have pretty big audiences. I think if we did a Google Hangout, it might be bad because if we had like literally 2,500 people watching live, which could be a very realistic possibility because I've had that situation happen, the Google compression codec, the video compression codec is garbage and it'll just literally unravel us. Mm -hmm. That's and what I don't, experienced. Yeah, and we, don't, and we don't want that to happen. So I think Rex is right. I think a live feed... Um, you know, from a controlled environment would probably be best. But yeah, I mean, I think that would be awesome. And we all know that we have people asking for that now. So that's something we need to think about for the future for sure. Great idea. Nice. Great idea. Okay. Awesome. Sounds right. great. Okay. So uh, same time or until next week, um, if you guys have any thoughts, again, please reach for us on Facebook, both Gerald, Seventh Planet, Seventh Planet Broadcasting on his YouTube channel and then Rex's YouTube channel, which is The Leak Project, will have these uh, broadcasts. We, we welcome you guys' questions and comments. Please uh, Matt, come Matt, forward. Why don't you give out – what's your channel, Matt? Your, your, yeah, for sure, yeah, Matt. I have, a, I have a Matt LaCroix for a YouTube channel, and um, you can find The Illusion of Us on there and on Amazon. Yeah. And I also, I also have The book, by the way. channel, too. Yeah, it's an amazing book. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much, and, guys. And, and it, I, I don't think I'm going to post these now on my YouTube channel because you guys are doing such a great job of getting them out there. But if you want to read my book, you know, my, my YouTube channel is pretty big. or It's not nearly like you guys, but it's growing fast now. It's TRTRevolution.com um, is my website. And then, of course, you can just find TRT Revolution on YouTube. But, uh, again, <laughs> we really are excited about these things, and they're growing. And if you, uh, if you want to be on our show and you have something to – you know, share with us. Please reach out to us through Facebook or through YouTube, and we'll be happy to have you come on. Because we're a community. Remember that. Absolutely, man.
Yeah. <laughs>